title, Overcomer's Circle. Principle Scripture teaches all Christians will be judged on their life's works. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 9 to 10. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 10. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So it's saying here, when he talks about the judgment seat, it's not referring to judgment to condemnation, but he's referring to judgment according to distribution of rewards and works done in this life. Which brings it to the next principle. Scripture indicates the Platonicus group does not, like all the other groups, stand before the judgment seat. Turn to Romans the 8th chapter, verse 30, we're going to look at some scriptures that build a case for the exclusion of the Platonicus group. Romans 8, verse 30. Moreover, we did predestinate, then we also called, and we called, then we also justified, and he justified them who also glorified. So what we find that this group in eternity has been declared justified, sanctified, and glorified. The glorification process takes place on the earth at the rapture. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 52 to 53. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we all shall be, <coughs> we all shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So he's referring to the most unique experience that will ever take place. And in this, this unique experience that Paul is referring to, as I shall know as I am known. Now with it, he said that, Scripture infers at the exact time of the change to glory, all the saints' rewards are manifested in them. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work, as his work shall be. <clears throat> so when the Lord returns, he's returning with each one's reward. He 
it's coming twice. The first time in the rapture, <coughs> the second time to set up the kingdom. That means that the first time, those that he's coming for, he's bringing their reward with him. Second Timothy, fourth chapter, verse seven and eight. fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all of them also that love is appearing talk about a day in which he's going to receive a crown the same day everybody going to receive a crown. The same day, everybody is going to be glorified. Romans, great chapter, verses 16 to 17. Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Everybody becomes glorified together. Everybody receives a crown together. Everybody. What's good for you? Romans 8, verses 16. 8. Everybody receives the glorification and the reward together as a unit. This is talking about the Prototicus group, the church of the firstborn. Principle. Scripture indicates at the rapture positions will be conferred automatically to the Potaticus group as each one is glorified. Revelation, the second chapter, verse 26 to 28. He that overcometh keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star, the dawn star glory, the glory that is in the image of his glory. Revelation, the second chapter, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear. The Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. But the inference is, at the time of the glorification, all of this is conferred instantaneously. Crowns appear, the name appears, the authority appears <coughs> to each man according as his reward is given. 
In other words, this whole aspect of standing before the Bema Seat, receiving rewards, I believe the scripture strongly affirmed does not apply to the Platonicus group. In Revelation, the third chapter, <coughs> verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. And how did that take place? How did Jesus get the authority to sit at the Father's throne? And how does he grant the authority for that one that's an overcomer to sit in his throne in the same way? through the resurrection through the glorification process he says I will raise him up at the last day raising him up all this what he's raised up all of this comes with the raising up with the glorification with the change in an instant from human to divine you come into all of that instantaneously. You find yourself with crowns. You find yourself with a glory. You find yourself with a comprehension of divinity. From human to divine in the twinkling of an eye. From limitation to infinity in the twinkling of an eye. That basically is the final step, the final stage of a series of progressions which we're currently undergoing. Turn to Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 45 to 47. then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. All. Matthew 24 <coughs> Verses 45 to 47. 45, okay. I said 35 to 37. 45. All right, all right, okay. Go on. <clears throat> so we see the principle here. It says, when he comes, he will make him ruler over all his goods. There is no standing before the Bema Seat receiving titles and Positions. This is going to happen to the Platonicus group instantaneously. You would say, well, where does the um, evaluation come in? This is the crux. The evaluation comes in before the rapture. Luke, the 21st chapter, verse 34 to 36. <coughs> Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. I'm going to emphasize that last passage. Cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall come on all them that draw in the face of the whole earth, who are going to be caught up with the cares of this life. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy 
this is the evaluation, that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Those that are accounted worthy, that's their being the seat judgment. The evaluation on the life be long before the rapture decision is going to be made. Then the decision is made and then you will know. Turn back to Revelation the third chapter. Verse 10, verse 11. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, in other words, you have patiently endured, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. No man take thy crown. Your spirit <coughs> gives you the assurance, number one, that you are a son of God, number two, that you have got the spirit there to guide you, and number three, it will let you know the assurance is that you passed the evaluation. All you have to do is to maintain, because you have everything waiting for you at your change. He's saying, Remain steadfast until your change. You miss the change and somebody else is going to get what was delegated to you. Now, in saying that, <coughs> what you're seeing is transpiring is the beginning of the entrance into things. People, well, we said this before, I'm going to say it again, People are going to suffer emotional tumult. They're going to suffer emotional changes in every area. Physical, spiritual, emotional. It's the principalities. They're pulling out all stops to do everything they can to keep anyone they can sidetrack, depressed, suicidal, whatever it takes. So understand with the things that you're going through, you don't have to stress, you don't have to worry about it. Just maintain your focus. Go through your day patiently. Don't let what these guys do upset you. That's them. It's not you. Understand that that's to be expected. And just know, as you overcome each day, you're passing your test, passing your trial. Tremendous changes are going to take place, they're going to take place suddenly. People aren't going to be able to deal with it. Because you're going to be focused on the changes, focused on the outer world not focused on the inside. You know you have been given the mandate of what the goal is and how to get there. That's all you need to, that's all you need to be concerned about. God's got your back. You see that every day. You can't show it anymore than showing it <coughs> and, 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 and not keep you from qualifying for your test, which is what we're all going through. Poor Mariko it's fantastic. She ain't doing so good. Everybody that would be a qualified candidate is going through this. It's just the beginning. So when we see it objectively, we know it for what it is. Your mind is giving you, your, not your mind, your spirit, is giving you a comprehension of a greater, a greater degree of consciousness, going to a higher consciousness level other assurance for that you know that you're on the path.
title, The Path Unobstructed. Scripture teaches a free life is dependent on a free mind. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 15 to 16. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct them, but we have the mind of Christ. Now when it says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, the word judge there in the Greek means discerns and investigates all things. The spiritual mind is designed to function in liberty, freedom, total objectivity because it's linked to the Spirit of God. And so, what we're looking at here is the natural, normal operation, the design of the spiritual mind. <clears throat> when it's allowed to flow freely, to operate freely, unrestricted, then total unrestricted liberty is lived by the life. Scripture teaches the spiritual mind is not influenced by the activities of person or persons of men. In other words, the spiritual mind is not subject to what men do or what men say or the influence of men. We're going to take a look at some scripture that illustrate this. Let's look at the seventh chapter, verse thirty one to thirty five. God said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not wept. But John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he hath a devil. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, he's saying, is comparing John the Baptist and himself in relationship to the receptivity of the generation in which they function. He's saying, you're like children in the marketplace saying, well, we have played the tune, you're not dancing to it. In other words, we have set the parameters in which you should operate. We have set the stage in which you should function. And when you make your entrance and when you make your exit, you're not doing that. And Jesus is saying to them, John the Baptist came. He didn't touch a, uh, a, a drop of wine but he didn't meet with your approval. I came eating and drinking and still didn't get your approval. He says, wisdom is justified of the children. In other words, what he's saying here is when you do the right thing, you're going to bear the fruit that shows that you have done the right thing, the wise thing, the correct thing of the life that you live. And Jesus is saying that basically you're wasting your time if you think that I'm going to dance to your tune. Wasting your time if you think John the Baptist is going to dance to your tune. We're not going to undertake your perspective of how we should operate, how we should act, what we should do. 
in that respect. So the spiritual mind is not going to allow itself to be limited by carnal restrictions nor by the influence of the movers and shakers of the society in which it happens to find itself. Turn to Matthew, 12th chapter, verses 38 to 40. verse 38 to 20 then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying Master we would see a sign from thee but he answered and said unto them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly <clears throat> so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and basically, this is a, 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 a further illustration of how the world will be trying to restrict and define the operations in which the spiritual mind should function. Here's Jesus going throughout Galilee, all of Israel performing signs and wonders. The dead being raised, the deaf having their hearing, the blind being given their sight, the gospel being preached, and these individuals have the temerity to come to him and say, we would seek a sign from you. In other words, telling him, well, we're not satisfied with what's been going on. We want to define what you do, what we say, and we'll believe you to be who you say you are. And Jesus looked them right in the face, right in the eye and said, you're not going to get one, one sign again. The same sign of Jonas is going to <clears throat> be the sign that I will give you. In other words, I'm going to be crucified and resurrect the third day. That's going to be the final sign. So Jesus never wavered under pressure from the movers and shakers of his society. He always sought beyond them. He never allowed himself to be limited by their restrictions. We see the same thing was true of Paul. Turn to Galatians, the second chapter. We're going to read verses 1 to 9. In uh, Galatians first chapter, Paul declares that the gospel that he preached was not given to him by men, it was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the instructions that he was to preach it the way he had received it. So now Paul talks about the past, the things that took place after he was converted, and then uh, given his uh, assignment, his ministry. So picking it up in Galatians, the second chapter, <clears throat> we're going to start in verse 1 and read down to verse 9. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. In other words, you see revelation, knowledge, and instruction that this is what he was to do. He communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. In other words, the gospel that he was given supernaturally by the Lord. But privately to them which were of reputation as to I, by any means I should run or I had run in vain. In other words, he was saying he gathered the elders together and presented the gospel to them uh, out of respect. In other words, he wasn't going there to try to grandstand anybody. He was going there to sh just simply deliver <coughs> his ministerial credentials. Verse 3. 
neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. In other words, saying, but Titus basically came under pressure to be circumcised. <clears throat> and that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. In other words, these are individuals who are reported to be movers and shakers in the inner circle in Jerusalem. They were law keepers. And um, Paul is saying that um, what they determined to do was to put pressure to their or Paul's group to get them to conform to their demands, their priorities. And the first priority, of course, was uh, keeping the law. He's a Gentile. He can't come in until he gets circumcised. So we see Paul's response to this. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. But the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In other words, he's saying, well, we didn't cave into them. As a matter of fact, we weren't about to. We came not to conform to them. We came to present our ministry to them on an equal basis. What they were trying to pressure them to do was to submit to their authority as elders in Jerusalem, in the high councils of the, the body of Christ in Jerusalem. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. In other words, Paul is saying, no matter how exalted they were, I wasn't impressed by them. And when we went into conference, when we went into uh, the ultimate meeting, he said they didn't add anything or take anything away from what I initially determined I was going to present to them. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty to me in towards the Gentiles. So what they saw was the power of God move when Paul spoke. And they saw the emperor, <coughs> miracles that were taking place in this conference. So they couldn't say anything or do anything because they knew the power of God was operating the same in Paul as it was in Peter. So after that, verse 9, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Paul is saying in his writings, I didn't go up here to get their permission to preach. I got my authority from Jesus Christ and I would not be moved one I older to do anything to <clears throat> belittle the authority I had in Christ. My gospel did not come from men, it came from God himself. So Paul goes in there and just presents. And I believe if they hadn't accepted it, it wouldn't have made him any difference. He would just continue to go on and preach what Jesus gave him to preach. So the spiritual mind is not influenced by the activities or the influence of men. What happens when a Christian compromises is that he drops down to his carnal mentality. The carnal mentality is always open to influence. And the enemy realizes that. And the enemy will try every way he can to distract, to pressure, to uh, enable the life to come down from the spiritual plateau, the mind of the spirit, and begin to function in the mind of the carnal the senses. And when he does that, then he's able to inject deviation in the life. Principle, Scripture teaches <clears throat> the spiritual mind is consistently evaluating its surroundings. 
testing all things in the light of revelation knowledge. <coughs> the spiritual mind is consistently in motion because God is consistently in motion. There's always something that the spiritual mind is actively engaged in. It never ceases. It never stops. The carnal mind is subject to the sectitudes of activities and rest. The carnal mind <coughs> is dominated by the emotions and the senses. And therefore, it is very seldom consistent in what it does because it's always being inundated by changes, inundated by things that are fluctuating. The spiritual mind is never. The spiritual mind is consistently on one flowing course because it's always in harmony with the Holy Spirit. So what we find here is that the scripture tells us that the spirit mind, the mind of the spirit is consistently evaluating its surroundings. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 3 to 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So he's saying the spirit mind never operates in the carnal. It's always operating in the spirit. And it's always alert. It's always on the offensive. Why? Because it realizes that it's in a war. And in a war, you can never let your guard down. The enemy doesn't rest. The battle starts on the spiritual plateau. It starts in the mind. And whatever happens in the mind translates into the life. And this is what the Scripture is telling us. <clears throat> God puts the spiritual mentality on the plateau that it's on so that it can survey all things and be open to evaluate objectively all things at all times. Even in your sleep, your mind is on guard. Notice what he goes on to say. <clears throat> Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The enemy operates in the thought life. That's where it starts. It starts in the thought. And when the mind is on the spiritual level that it should be on, it's on the carnal level, it will entertain thoughts that run contrary to the truth of God, and the truth of revelation knowledge that God has given us. And when that happens, and the mind begins to entertain thoughts, set thoughts. The enemy will build a stronghold in the thought life. And that stronghold will eventually translate into a habit, into life's direction. The person will begin to act out the thought. The thought translates into a belief. The belief translates into activity predicated off of the belief. And when the thought is contrary to the truth of God's word, then the life will begin to go astray. Now what Paul says, the mind of the spirit will initially, immediately kick out contrary thoughts won't allow them to remain long enough to take root and to become uh, ingrained in the thought stream and the reason that you find cults as successful as they are is because they're able to 
ingrained in the thinking of their adherents a belief system that's contrary to God's truth. And that belief system becomes a, a fortress. It becomes ingrained in the thought stream, which becomes, ultimately, it translates into the physical as a belief, as an activity, and as a method, a mode of life. And the imagination <clears throat> builds a stronghold and ultimately becomes ingrained in the behavior of the individual. People who are neurotic, people are, who are psychotic, people that have personality changes, <clears throat> are so as a result of their thought life becoming corrupted. They have allowed the mind to accept a belief pattern that's based on subjectivity, not objectivity. In other words, not things as they are, but things as they are, appear to be. And as a result, they accept it as absolute objectivity. That's why you cannot dialogue objectively with a person who is neurotic. Because they never see objectively. They can't evaluate a fact objectively. They see it subjectively depending upon how they have been brought to believe that particular aspect. <clears throat> and so you can never reach a point where you can objectively evaluate particular thing. That's why you can't deal with a cult member <clears throat> from an objective perspective. What you have to do is to demolish their belief system. And then you can begin to dialogue with them from an objective perspective. Destroy the fortress <clears throat> that their faith rests on. So, what we find here is the spiritual mind is consistently evaluating never going to allow the life to receive untruth so that a stronghold of unbelief can be built up within it. Next principle. Scripture teaches the spiritual mind does not seek relationships with minds not progressing in truth in life. In other words, this mind that's based spiritually <coughs> will not tolerate a relationship with a mentality that's not on the same plateau. God's programmed it to be that way. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 14 to 18. <clears throat> not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, the spiritual mind that's <coughs> programmed to live in liberty, spiritual freedom will never allow itself to be linked to anything less than another spiritual mind that's progressing in freedom. Why? Because the true spiritual mind realizes that it will go into bondage in a relationship in anything less than a true progression in light. It knows it. It realizes that. And it seeks the, the conformity of Unity. In other words, a spirit mind desires another spirit mind to dwell in unity with. 
the body of Christ is consistently referring to unity. Be Can it be affected? The carnal mind, on the other hand, if allowed to do so, will take the life directly into bondage because it operates off the emotions, which are totally subjective. The spiritual mind operates off of revelation knowledge, which is based on objectivity, truth. Truth is always, 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 always objective. Truth will tell you things as they are, not as they appear to be. And therefore, the spiritual mind, which is grounded in truth, will always seek that which is totally objective. It will not allow itself to go into bondage. People backslide because they gravitate away from the spiritual liberty that they have. So in the Galatians, the fifth chapter. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, <clears throat> in the liberty, freedom, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, in order to remain free, you have to fight. And as simple as that, because the enemy is not going to rest. The enemy is going to consistently try to spot an opening in which he can bring you down to a lower level and then influence what he wants to influence into your thought stream and into your life. <clears throat> so as Christians, the scripture is consistently telling us, number one, to be alert, test all things, prove all things. Never settle, but maintain a standard and never compromise that standard. <clears throat> the biggest enemy that we have is ourselves because you're your thoughts and your emotions, which operate in subjectivity, gravitate toward just having themselves fulfilled in the moment. <clears throat> but the spiritual mind is uh, the sentinel which will guard the life, protect the life, and maintain the liberty that Christ has initially given us. Turn to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 6 to 11. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. In other words, he's saying, <clears throat> listening to men will lead you to destruction. Uh, the majority of the body of Christ is going to lose out because it's listening to the wrong voice. And you have warning after warning after warning. The same warning. Um, keep your finger in Genesis and uh, Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Turn over to Matthew, the twenty-four. Now, 
Matthew 24, verses 3 to 4. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So they're asking him, Well, how are we going to know when it's close to the time of your coming? The first thing that Jesus said in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. The same thing Paul was saying, now you can turn back to, go, uh, to Ephesians. Fifth chapter, starting in verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Scripture consistently tells us that the body of Christ has been drawn away by listening to people whose words sound right. They're going to be deceived by a number of different methods of people speaking deception. <clears throat> Verse 7. Be ye therefore part be not therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness. In other words, you were sometimes in darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodly, goodness, and righteousness, and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So, the Spirit that's operating in liberty understands that establishing relationships with those things that are outside of a relationship in light is going to prove unfruitful. And in that respect, the Holy Spirit keeps us on the alert. <clears throat> now, turn to Galatians, the 6th chapter, verses 15 to 17. neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. In other words, he's saying <coughs> the only thing that matters is being a new creation. Circumcision and all the, 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 the trappings of functional religion don't mean a thing. What is important is being a new creation progressing toward the finished Product. Anything beyond that is going to be unprofitable. Verse 16, And as many as walk according to this rule, <coughs> peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. In other words, he's saying, um, I'm serving notice on all the false teachers, all the false apostles, all the false prophets. Don't bother me. I'm progressing toward the finish line. When he talks about, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, he's talking about he's focusing on participating in the sufferings of Christ the finish point. So he's talking about his focus is fixed. He could care less about the influences of men, what they say about him, what they do. It won't make them a bit of difference. The only way that they can get rid of him is to kill him. <clears throat> this is what he's writing to the Galatians. In Christ, we 
find that God has us progressing toward a goal. We did a lesson on this a couple of days ago. And that goal is that we're on a time schedule. We have to achieve a certain series of maturity steps to prepare us for the time of the rapture. The rapture is not a, a, a thing where you're going to suddenly be taken up to heaven. Yeah, that's true. Well, <clears throat> the feet won't leave the ground unless there is a change. We are changed first, and then we're taken up. No change, no ascension. <clears throat> no progression to prepare for the change, and the change doesn't take place. God has each one of us in an individual progression because each one is a unique creation. The Holy Spirit functions in each life uniquely, bringing that life into what it needs to prepare itself for the final change. <clears throat> the rapture is merely the final change in a series of changes. And each change matures us, prepares us for the final change. If a person stops his progression or slows his progression down, he's just not going to be ready when he acts why acts his cross. It's as simple as that. God is in motion. God's not waiting for anybody. God put his plan in in eternity. Jesus said the Father had picked a day and an hour in which these things are going to happen. So it's already set in motion. What we're doing is progressing toward it. In line, in tandem, with the move of the Holy Spirit. So what you're going to have is <clears throat> X number of people who arrive at that point and those people will all experience the same change. Uh, turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans the 8th chapter picking it up verses 16 to 17 the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and if children and heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may be glorified together. We have to experience the sufferings of Christ in the way in which the Father has designed us to experience them. And when we do, it says we will be glorified together. In other words, those, those people that have completed the course, that X day, they're all going to be glorified simultaneously. Those that haven't, well, yeah, as simple as that. So, we want to progress with the move of the Holy Spirit. And you find it's very easy to fall out of progression. I see people who have been so far behind that they have they've lost all sense of direction. The enemy has been allowed to put things in their life that have blinded them uh, left them in obscurity as to whether or even they're on even on a path in any particular direction. That's his job. That's what he wants to do. That's his game plan. <clears throat> Our goal is to make ourselves available to be changed to the finished product that God designed us to be changed to in eternity at the time in which be ready. And, uh, it's not easy. But, the Father says, if we determine that that's what we're going to do, God will give us the ability to complete our course. It's a promise from Him. He'll be with us every step of the way. He will guide us, minister to us, reward us, bless us. He will bring us to that point at which 
life itself takes second place to our progression of Christ. The decision of making ourselves available means that we are willing to put down everything to achieve that one thing. The readiness for the change. Paul illustrates that and uh, all the most of the apostles illustrated it by just willing to lay down their lives rather than compromise. They could have lived but they realized what they would have lost. So they preferred to have <coughs> laid it all down and received what the Lord uh, was calling them to receive. And the same, the same choice is ours. God doesn't force anybody to do anything. He just gives us the opportunity. And when we realize this golden opportunity, this once in an eternity opportunity, it's more valuable than anything else.